G'day Jaffa Adventures, Terry King here. Welcome to the channel. Today I'm going to talk all things TechStream. Have you got yourself a laptop computer? And have you got yourself a Land Cruiser 200? If you've got those two things, you're only a very few steps away from being able to read the ECUs within your vehicle. And when you can do that, it'll open up a whole world of opportunity for you from a diagnostics point of view. You want to learn how to get your laptop to communicate with your 200 series? Stick around. So what are the things that you need to be able to do this? Well, number one, you need yourself a 200 series Land Cruiser. That's probably the most expensive component out of this exercise. Number two, you need yourself a laptop computer or a portable computer that you can take inside of the vehicle. A desktop is not going to work. That laptop computer should have the capability of plugging in a USB connector. And lastly, you'll need one of these OBD2 port reader cables. These things are as cheap as chips. I bought mine off of ePray, but I'm sure there's many, many different vendors where you could get these things from. Now I'm going to strictly talk Windows operating system. I am not versed in Apple operating systems at all, so if you're looking for an Apple conversation, it's probably best you check elsewhere because that's not what this is going to be about. Now these mini VCI cables are designed to operate in a 32-bit operating system, and almost all modern operating systems are 64-bit. Now I have had success with these cables in a 64-bit operating system. I think it was in Windows 7. I was able to get this thing working through special device driver installations and through registry hacks, but it was never easy. It was a really complicated process. And of course the problem is once I did get this thing working and if Windows threw an update at you, nine times out of 10, it'd take the drivers out and your cable would stop working again. It was just extremely frustrating. So the only way that I found around this, and it's dead easy, is to get a 32-bit operating system to run this cable in which it was designed for. I'm using Windows 11 at the moment. I know this solution will work with Windows 10 as well, and I suspect it'll work with any other Windows 64-bit operating system. And of course, the beauty of this is if Windows does throw an update at you, you will always have that 32-bit solution, which I'm about to share with you, and it will not disrupt the communication that your cable has with your computer. So let's jump in and I'll walk you through how we're actually going to do this. Now this is the website that you jump to, VirtualBox Download. Then you choose your operating system. And we're talking Windows now, so we'll click on that one. That's downloading the virtual box now. And now we open the file. Just run through, keep all the defaults that we've got here. Once it's installed, you just hit finish, and then you will find on your desktop the Oracle VM virtual box icon. The next step is to jump into this I Hate Mud forum, and this fella here has created a link to download the text stream. So you just click on that link. Hit the save button and it'll download the file to your downloads folder on Windows. Now you go to that image file in your downloads and you open that one up. And this is setting up a virtual system within the virtual box. And what you can see here is we've got the guest operating system of Windows XP 32-bit. That is what you're after. So you hit the import button. And what we've got when we finished is the TechStream application inside of the Oracle VirtualBox. Now you can see that the operating system is identified as Windows XP 32, but if you jump into settings, you can also double check that it's got a 32-bit version. Now that that's highlighted, hit the magical start button. That's going to boot up the VirtualBox, and inside of the VirtualBox will run Windows XP. So it's running Windows inside of Windows. Now we get our handy dandy mini VCI cable. You can see here we're running Windows XP and we simply take the USB connection on that and plug that into our laptop. And on your VCI cable, the little LED should light up, meaning that it's been powered up and recognized. Next step, you go into this MVCI firmware update tool, hit device info, 
and it should populate all of these boxes here. If it doesn't populate those boxes, the drivers have not been successfully installed and the computer is not recognizing your mini VCI device. If that happens, you got to seek advice from a higher power. Our next step is to launch TechStream itself. So you double click that icon and you wait for TechStream to boot up. It's somewhat of a slow program actually. Next step, you want to jump into Setup and go into this Vim Select. Just make sure Xhorse MVCI is selected. It's got a drop down box and there's a few you can choose from. It should be defaulted to that, but just make sure that it is because this is the one that hacks the cable. The next thing you want to do is jump into Setup and go into TechStream Configuration and you want to select the other region if you live in Australia. And what that'll do is that'll set up the global program. Leave all of these things default. It's all good. And there we have it. The configuration of TechStream has changed to the global setting, as you can see by reading the screen. Now, the first time we connect TechStream to the vehicle, it's going to ask for a registry key. This little program is that registry key. You can try copying and pasting it into TechStream. That did not work for me. I actually had to key it in off of the keyboard. Either way, once you get the registry key into TechStream, you only need to do that on the first occasion. Now I got my laptop sitting in the car. It's time to hook this cable up to the OBD port so that we can hook up the TechStream to the vehicle's internal computer systems. There's your dash and underneath your steering wheel, right here is the OBD port that you want to plug that cable into. This thing here you probably won't have, that's for my scan gauge. So we take our mini VCI cable here and we plug them in. Just like so. Now that we've got our cable hooked up to the OBD port, which is hooked up to our laptop, the vehicle has to be on, either running or in on, because right now the ECU in the car is idle. So there is no communication happening between the two. So engine start the first one puts you into accessory mode second button push puts you into start mode and now the computer is active now we'll boot up TechStream and this program's a little bit slow but the reason is you got to remember it's four layers deep you're running your normal Windows operating system like Windows 10 then inside of that you're running the virtual box inside of the virtual box you're running Windows XP, and inside of Windows XP, you're running TechStream. We then hit Connect to Vehicle, and here is where you need to put that registry key in. I tried copying and pasting it, and I could not get it to paste for whatever reason. So in my instance anyway, I've actually got to key it in. All keyed in, we hit OK. Then it brings up your next dialog box, and you type that exact same number in again. Now you hit this connect to vehicle button and you wait for the magic to happen. Again, you just have to be patient. It will happen. Initializing USB connection. And now we're connecting to vehicle. Now in this dialog box, you select the model of Land Cruiser that you've got. And depending on which one of these you select depends on which of the options that are included. I have found that this 1008 has been the best for me, but you can go ahead and play around with that. And there we have it. Now what you see in front of you is every single one of the ECUs that the car has. And you can see that these things are all in yellow at the moment. And it says here ECU status unknown. What that means is TechStream has not queried these ECUs for any codes yet. Now you can go into the individual ECUs. You can either double click on that ECU or you can hit this little arrow button down in the bottom right. And if you hit that little arrow button in the bottom right, it'll pull up that particular ECU and it will query it when it pulls it up. And there we have the engine ECU and you can see over in these columns here there are no codes, there are no DCTs or trouble codes that have been pulled up. So that particular ECU is all clear. You can see up here in the left, each time you open up an ECU, it brings up a new tab. 
So if I go back into this system select, which is the screen that pops up first and has all of our ECUs, you can see this button here called health check. I find that that one is a pretty good one because what it'll do is it'll query every single one of these ECUs and run a health check on them and it'll pull up any code that any of these ECUs have. So you don't actually have to go into each one individually. This takes a little bit of time, but it's definitely worth doing. So let's jump into it and see what comes up. Just hit the next button and you can see here it says checking system 0 of 28. So we've got a little bit of time to wait as it runs through and queries each one of those ECUs. Now through the magic of editing, you've only had to wait a couple of seconds. I've actually had to wait two or three minutes for it to perform this complete health check, but we're nearly there. We've got two systems left to check. And there we go. These are all of the ECUs that it's queried and that it's potentially found an issue with. These ones here, I don't know why it's pulled those up because it hasn't recorded any codes, but these top four, there are actually trouble codes and some of them are current and some of them are historical. So if we jump into SRS airbag, for example, now we're in the SRS airbag and we've got a code B1856 and the description is open in rear side squib left hand circuit. No idea what that means but it's a historical code it's not a current code. I suspect I've triggered that code when I pulled my rear seats out before I put the hack in place to actually trick the computer into thinking the rear seats were there. What you can do is you can hit that little magnifying glass it'll query it again and it says no malfunctions now. So you go down here into the bottom left and you can clear that code. You hit that little button and it'll clear any current or historical code. And there we go. That's done. No codes now in that particular computer system. I'm back in the engine ECU. You can see that through this tab right here or you can get it through your system select. Fantastic place from a diagnostics point of view is to hit this data list button when you're in that engine ECU and have a look at what gets pulled up. Bang! This is every single engine sensor in the ECU and it's live data. So right now the vehicle's not running so obviously you can see engine runtime here is zero. Let's start the vehicle up. Vehicle's now running and you can see that by the voltage has changed engine runtime is now changed to 10 seconds etc now one area that i absolutely love on this data list are these injector feedback values and you can see here are our values now there's actually a specification on these a uh, plus three to minus three and any of these numbers outside that range means you've got an injector that needs replacing Every service, I check these on a cold engine and on a warm engine, and I record them. So I'll know well in advance when an injector is heading out, and I'll know that before it toasts my motor. If you're interested in what each of these individual readings means, let me know in the comment section below, and I may put together another video where we go through this line item by line item. The other thing that you can do, you can see down here in the bottom hand right, there's a record button you can record these values in real time and graph them or take it down in an Excel spreadsheet. The last system that I want to show you is this ABS, VSC, and TRC, which is your braking stability system. So let's jump into that ECU. You can see here I've got a current code, master reservoir level malfunction. And the reason for that is I'm in the middle of bleeding my brakes at the moment and I've drained most of the fluid out of the master cylinder. So there's actually a sensor in there that's telling me that. So that's pretty cool. What I wanted to show you, however, is this utility button. Hit utility and up comes a couple of things that you can do. I don't know what all of these do, but air bleeding, if you click on that little sucker down here in the bottom, it says use function after replacing brake actuator. This function is used to bleed air from the brake system. Hit that little arrow right button. And 
up comes this dialog box that says welcome to the air bleeding utility tells you exactly what it does and it gives you any special notes or conditions so you hit next and you just follow the prompts so select the line you'd like to bleed if you want to bleed the front right line that's the one you select and you hit next now I'm not going to go into details on this because this will be covered in my video on my brake replacement but how cool is that you can actually use the ECU to bleed your brake system once you've finished using TechStream and you shut it down then you shut your window down so you just go into this little start turn computer off now that's not actually going to turn the computer off it's only going to turn Windows XP off so hit turn off <laughs> And Windows XP is gone. You're back to your normal operating system. You can then shut down your virtual box and go on your merry way. How cool is that? Well, there you've got it, folks. A mini VCI cable, a laptop computer, a Land Cruiser 200, and they're all communicating with one another. As I said earlier, I'm no TechStream genius, but I have been using this for some time now, and it's been working brilliantly. I trust you found this video useful. I wish you all the best with your own installation. Sometimes these things can be immensely frustrating. I get that. The next video I've got on the cards is the disc brake replacement and rotor replacement on the 200. And we're going to pull that tech stream out again because that's how we're going to bleed the brakes. Thanks for watching, everybody. I hope you got some useful information out of this. Until next time, keep the shiny side up. Bye now.